So from what you can remember, how many promises have you kept for yourself? And those promises that you kept for yourself, for yourself, and you came through, how did you feel? It could be anything, like reading a book, staying on a diet, hitting to the gym, making the phone calls you need to make for your business. How did you feel when you came through with your promises? What's the flip side? How did you feel when you didn't keep the promises that you promised yourself? You cheated on your diet, you cheated on your spouse, girlfriend, you compromised your business. How did you feel when the promises that you kept yourself was a complete disaster? And for those of you watching this, how did you feel when you made promises to God? How did you feel when you came through with those promises and how did you feel when you didn't come through with those promises. My wife constantly reminds me all the time, you promised not to me, you promised to God, you had vows. Because oftentimes, uh, listen, if there's a more honorable and respectful one between the two of us, it's definitely my wife. I'm constantly working on it. I'm nowhere near close, perfect, but I'm working, striving towards excellence. And hope you are too. But there's oftentimes we make promises to God and yet we don't come through. How do you feel? And for some of you struggling with your faith, you wanna to go to church, but you don't go to church because either A, how the pastor makes you feel, or B, how other people in the church make you feel, or how other people in former churches that you went to made you feel too as well. You just don't want to deal with the riffraff. You just rather stay home, isolated, you're on your couch, your car, your house, your safe space, and that's where you want to deal with God all by yourself. So in this episode of the Wealth and Wisdom series, we're going over Ecclesiastes chapter 5, written by the wisest and richest king who ever lived, and that is King Solomon. So if you're catching the series for the very first time, we've been unpacking Proverbs and Ecclesiastes for the last year, and we want you to know that all these series are on our YouTube channel here called the Wealth and Wisdom Series. So be sure, if you want to look at other Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that we've unpacked, again, these books written by the richest and wisest king who ever lived, make sure you subscribe and check out the other episodes we have on here. So as we uncover and unpack chapter five of Ecclesiastes, I want you to think about three words. I want you to think of the words reverence. I want you to think of the word gotcha. I want you to think of the word money. You got it? Okay, let's cover the first one. Now in chapter five, King Solomon has some sharp and harsh words for the positions you have with your words, starting with the first two verses of this chapter. And the reason why they're harsh and they're tough positions to follow it's because we're in an era right now where everybody doesn't want to listen and everybody wants to talk. If you don't agree with each other, one tries to talk over the other person until the person proves themselves right instead of learning how to understand the other person's point of view. So therefore you can have healthy debates that allow both parties to evolve and grow. Because today, even if you say the wrong things or even maybe the right things loud enough, you're gonna attract eyeballs and millions of eyeballs and attention wants to come your way and advertising dollars wants to come your way. So regardless of reverence, people today just want to get eyeballs and views and clicks and likes and engagement because that's what pays. The second part of Ecclesiastes chapter five with King Solomon having harsh words with is money because today with inflation going up, the crisis going on with living paycheck to paycheck, people today are consumed with problems and money and where they are financially speaking and King Solomon has some interesting words here about money. Let's look at chapter five, verse one and two here of Ecclesiastes. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know anything that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. So as I'm listening to Ken Solomon say these words and write these words down, I'm envisioning what church looked like back then in the tabernacle that King Solomon had built. And by the way, he was very exact of how he built the house of God, his tabernacle. I mean, if you look at this video here, the vastness and the specifics of width, length, depth, height was very specific in how he built the house of God. And so forth, when he says, come to God with reverence and on these steps, it's like breaking a pattern of how quickly we go through life. Zipping here, zipping here, appointment here, appointment there, responsibility here, responsibility here, bill here, bill there. God wants you reverent when you're entering His presence. You gotta stop whatever's going on with life, take a time out, and come into the presence of God, breaking up your steps that you normally have a pace at, slow down, and honor the authority 
of God. And here's the thing though, a lot of people today, ask them today if they wanna to go to church. Ask them today if they even have a faith. Faith in religion in America today is on a steep decline, more so in the history of America the last 40, 50, 60 years. Big part of it, 1962, what did they remove from schools? They removed the Bible, and any faith or prayer that's expressed in our school system, they removed that, and guess what has to now be dependent upon? Parents, and guess what has happened to parents in the last 40, 50, 60 years since 1960s and 70s? A lot more divided families, blended families, separated families, divorced families, more single moms, single dads. I was a single dad, three kids, raising my children before I got remarried again. So I understand these issues and I understand these problems in a very deep way, in a very personal way. And when I started following Christ 19 years ago, when I turned 30 years old, I said, you know what, God, I tried it my way for 20 years, all the way to 29 years old. I said, you know what? And I write in my book, Faith Made a Millionaire. I said, I woke up on the other side of the street at six o'clock in the morning from, coming from a party thinking I was home, but I was actually in my car driving on the opposite side of the road, still hung over. I pulled over to the side. I said, man, what, what are you doing to yourself? You almost orphaned your kids worse. You could have killed some instant person driving your way. You need to get your life together. And since then, I stepped into the presence of God. I said, you know what, God? I tried it my way. I'm not happy. 20 years of my life, my entire 20s, I've got nothing to show for outside of my children and a bunch of uh, no caller ID missed calls because I don't want to pick up the phone because all the bill collectors are calling me. So at 30 years old, I said, you know what, let me step into the presence of God because I was sick and tired of the mistakes I was making, the lack of promises I was keeping. And listen, I was in the Marine Corps. I said, I, I believe in integrity. And yet I wasn't living a life of integrity. I was challenging myself. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror with integrity. I couldn't look at my children with integrity, knowing that I'm just talking out my mouth, but not really following through with the action I'm asking my children or those who are working around me to do themselves. I wasn't following it. I was talking to talk, but I wasn't walking the walk. This is what the danger that King Solomon was warning. I was following it too as well. And today, since 30 years old, I've been conscious of making sure I'm by nowhere near perfect, but I'm still conscious of making sure that I'm reverent. I'm speaking when I'm in the presence of God and speaking of God with others, that there's a reverence and honor and respect. Think about this real quick. Imagine if more people in society today operate their business that way operate their families that way, operate their communities and cities that way. How much better would our city and our states and our country be if we understood and reminded ourselves in God we trust. And in that presence, with reverence, we come upon God, we call upon God, we're under His authority and under His love and His grace that we can operate this way and how much our children and next generations would follow in that way too as well. And those steps with reverence God, according here to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. So if that's you, and you need to be reminded of that, please put it in the comment section below. I'm walking in reverence to God. Again, in the comment section below, I'm walking in reverence to God. Put it in the comment section below. Which leads me to my second takeaway from chapter 5. I call this the three gotchas of leadership. I'm reading this Bible here for the John Maxwell Leadership Bible on how John Maxwell, a leadership expert and guru, how he unpacks the perspective of the Bible through the lens of a leader. And here's what he says, there are three gotchas. Let's take a look at this. First gotcha is a hasty speech. Second gotcha is empty promises. And the third gotcha is lame excuses. Okay, so let's uncover this. In Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse two and three, let's read what it says. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are in earth, so let your words be few. Verse 3, a dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. Sometimes we're so fast to talk and respond and rebut versus us actually listening. I get caught up in this all the time too because when I'm in a disagreement, how much uh, emotions go up and logic goes down? How many guys have been caught that way? I've, I've been caught that way. I've learned to have less emotion. Boy, that is a lot of work but also raise logic, so therefore effective communication can still be had. Otherwise, it's just yelling, 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 and next thing you know, according to King Solomon here in Scripture, you're a fool. I don't want to be a fool. Do you want to be a fool? Of course you don't want to be a fool. Which leads me to the second point. The second gotcha is empty promises. Let's read what it says here in verse 4 and 5. It reads like this. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Woo! One of the things I 
watch and I observe when I'm watching movies, let's say Gladiator or Braveheart or any movies back in the medieval times, I notice how men, their word was bond. They die to protect their word. They would shake on those promises because they knew they were going to come through. Why? Because the first order was true. That whatever you do unto men is also doing unto God. And because their first reverence is to God, they treat men godly and holy. They want to make sure that whatever they said came out of their mouth, they promised and they came through and because there was their agreement. And what's going on today? People today make agreements and break them all day long. Break divorces, yeah, I got married. Oh God, great party, great marriage. And you know, six months later, a year later, broken promises, ah, then let me get them out of my life. Let me take half of what they have and let me just go to court and get from them what I need. See, that's what broken promises and how, how, how does that help you live a better life? What about people that uh, signed uh, credit card balances and, 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 and bank agreements? Or we're talking about uh, Javon Dexter with the NIL deals. People sign a contract to get money, but when it's time to pay up or to abide by their part of the agreement, what do they do? They want to nix it. They want to renege it. Why? Because it's inconvenient for them to follow through with their word. Well, guess what? There's many, many times I've learned over the last 19 years of walk with Christ that if I say something, as much as I don't like it, I got to follow through. Yana Van Zandt once said, your brain reflects the consciousness that goes into your bank account. So therefore, if your bank account and you're conscious of your money, guess what? Your bank account will reflect your consciousness. She says something else too as well, that your credit report is a reflection of your attitude. Ooh, if I did a credit check right now, and people were watching this video. What does your credit say about you? And by the way, there's no judgment for those of you watching this because I was the worst guy. I realized that me filing bankruptcy in 1996, filing through with my promises, I was never in a happy position. Why? Because I obligated myself for the short-term benefit of using the money, but I was rethinking about not paying in the back of my head to those I agreed to pay. God can't honor that. God can't honor empty promises. So it's a biblical principle here that if you're going to say you're going to do something, by all means, follow through. Guess what happens to you with your confidence when you come through with your word? Guess what happens to your finances when the banks know you come through with your word too as well? Your credit goes up, you have access to capital, access to credit, you're able to operate a business, you're able to provide products and services because your customers know that your community knows that you're coming through with the promises. They say, I'm pay you in exchange for this dollar, $10, whatever monetary exchange. They know they're going to receive a product or service that's valuable to them over and above the monetary value of which they paid. Can you do that? Don't make any promises. Which leads me to number three, lame excuses why you don't come through. Let's read what it says here in verses six and seven. It goes like this. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin and do not protest to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. Woo! You come through, you don't. Think about God, you asking God for a miracle and God says he's gonna come through with the miracle. And he says, yeah, you know, I'm gonna think twice about it. I'm gonna give it to somebody else. How would you feel? At the same time too as well, your children ask you for something. You said you're gonna give them something and then you don't. How do you think your child feels towards you? Listen, I've gotten so close to God more because I realized how much of a fool and a mess I am without him. The dealings of my business, the dealings with my children, the dealings with my wife. I am a fool to think that I can consume myself in excuses of telling everybody. For example, I'd say, the reason why I'm not happy, the reason why I'm not here, the reason why I can't do that, because you did this and you did that. Listen, those are lame excuses. You made a promise, you made a vow, King Solomon says, come through. Can you do that? Like myself, I had to ask myself this question, can you do better? And meanwhile, if you think you can get away with it, you can lie to everybody else. And by the way, they'll believe you. You can lie to everybody, but there's one person that you can't lie to, and that's you. It's the man and the woman in the mirror. You can't lie to that person. That's gonna give you a direct reflection of that. Now you can think of other things and can try to distract yourself from what that reflection is, but at the end of the day, that mirror is gonna reflect back what actually you are in that instant moment. My third takeaway here from King Solomon is money that riches, according to him, is meaningless. Now think about this, this is the richest and wisest king who ever lived, and he's saying that money and riches is meaningless. What? Don't you need riches? Don't you want to be rich? Well, according to King Solomon, he says it's meaningless, which by the way, before I continue on with this, this is the exact reason why a lot of people in the faith, why people in religion 
say is don't pursue that career, don't pursue that business because for the fact that you're gonna get rich because Ken Salman says being rich is meaningless. But the same vein, out of the other mouth said, listen, we need your tithes and offerings to fund and finance this church. So which one is it? So when you're looking at money and the understanding of what money is, money is simply a tool. Let's look at what it says here in scripture in Ecclesiastes. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with the income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of the laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I have a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune so that when they have children, there's nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from the toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart, and what do they gain? Since they toll for the wind, all their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Let me remind you, this is Ecclesiastes. This is at the end of King Solomon's life. He started well, but he's not finishing well. He's, in my opinion, a little bit of contrain because also in Proverbs it says, in many scriptures it says, you should also leave an inheritance to your children and your children's children, right? That the, that the inheritance of their fathers is house and riches. This is biblical scripture. These are some of the words that even King Solomon himself wrote. And yet at the end, in Ecclesiastes, towards the end of his life, he said, ah, Money's meaningless, riches are meaningless. Sure helped you build that temple though. Sure helped you build a vast army where everybody for 40 years on your reign, King Solomon, was very ha happy and very prosperous. You had the Queen of Sheba come visit you, counseled you, blessed so many people, created so many jobs, you expanded your territory for God, and now you're saying that riches is meaningless? In the meantime, for those 40 years, everybody needed those riches to expand what you had envisioned, that God envisioned for you to expand into, more territory, Wealth, prosperity for the people that followed God, it sure helped then, didn't it? And now it's meaningless? I don't get it, a little contrarian here. But in the New Testament, young Timothy says in 1 Timothy 6.10, he says, the love of money is the root of all evil, not money itself. We need money to fund and finance the things we need to buy for our family, for education, put food on the table, roof over our heads, the right education around the same values and principles that we agree with, so therefore we're not looking over our back for eight and nine hours wondering what the teacher's gonna be teaching our kids when they're away from us, to find and finance the right personnel, the right military to defend our country. So many things I can continue on and on with money. So money is very effective when used the right way. And reading the scripture is not to confuse you to not pursue your ambitions, your desires, to expand your career, your business, expand your offerings, so therefore you can help service more people. And I was having a conversation with another guy, he says, how much is enough? Listen, I was reminded of Colonel Sanders' story. Colonel Sanders gave his life to Christ at 77 years old. After 12 years of starting KFC, at 77 years old, he gave his life to Christ. He was a hero in the South, Louisville, Kentucky, he was a hero. At 77 years old, he still gave his life to Christ. There was an interview of Colonel Sanders raising money for the Christian uh, uh, Bible Network. I'm not sure exactly what uh, a TV uh, a channel was, but he goes on to saying, by the time they put me in the ground, that's when I'm gonna stop working. Because if there's value I can still bring to this earth, why retire? Be financially free all day. So therefore you can be on purpose. Think about this real quick. Of all the things that you do in your life, the 40, 50, 60 hours that you invest to your boss, your, even your business, are you loving it? Is there purpose behind it? Are you jacked up? Are you running it? Are you driving it? Or is it driving and running you? Because you may be off purpose or you may be on purpose because if you're on purpose, guess what? You'll never need an alarm clock. You don't have to worry about not being fired up with what you do. You have to worry about this word called burnout. You'll be fired up and excited because you feel that God has got something special for you to accomplish. I can't tell you how awesome that is to feel that God is behind you because the dream he gave you, the purpose he gave you. And by the way, if God gave you a dream, it's not for you to process it with anybody else. They're not supposed to understand it. And their lack of understanding God's dream for you and their lack of interpreting it, guess what? They might talk you out of the dream that God's given you. Your job, if God has given you a dream to do something big and special with your life, is to seek out those that will foster and cultivate and grow 
that seed and purpose that's growing in your spirit, your gut, your soul. That's what's going to fire you up and allow you to recruit the tools, gather the finances, enlist the help of those that are meant to help you get to the next level of your life. I'll wrap up with verse 18 and 19 here because King Solomon gives us direct instructions of what to do with money. It reads like this. This is what I observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. And for some of you watching this, you've been blessed with a career, business, you're thriving. This is a gift from God. Now, certain things have been taken away from you. You've faced the reversal. Well, guess what? This too is a gift from God. Because what I've understood through my life, through bankruptcy, through divorce, family court, the nastiness of life, when you're in the worst position, you're actually in the best position. Trust God. After all, that's what it says on our money. In God, we trust. Amen. Been watching it all the way up until this point, please put in the comment section below. My wealth and my money is a gift from God. Put in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out the other Wealth and Wisdom series where I unpack Ecclesiastes 1, 2, and 3, and 4, as well as the 31 other Proverbs that King Psalm has written in the Bible. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. Hit like, drop your comments below. That being said, I'm your money smart guy from Dallas, Texas, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you. Bye-bye.